is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Rohit Garg, who is one of the co-founders of Practice by Numbers, alongside his wife, Dr. Didi Agarwal, who's a dentist from Boston University. They have created multiple startup practices in the Seattle area. They used the experience gained in creating and running dental startup practices into the development of Practice by Numbers. Practice by Numbers now actively used in hundreds of practices across the United States and has a very loyal following on Dental Town, which is where I met you on the message boards. Before running Practice by Numbers, Rohit worked as the Director of Clinical Research for Philips Healthcare. Rohit earned a BE in Electrical Engineering from the Indiana Institute of Technology, which means he must be an, a Hoosier and a master's in electrical engineering from the University of Washington. Rohit has filed over 15 patents with six granted. My God, if you were on Shark Tank, that's the first question Mr. Wonderful would ask. He says, do you have anything to protect your business? Do you have any patents? Anybody could run that business. If you don't have a patent, he'd say, you're dead to me. So you're <laughs> not dead to Mr. Wonderful. He uh, would no. love you. And uh, so, um. You know, this has been a pet peeve of mine since day one that dentists spend all their time studying clinical dentistry, which is awesome and amazing, but they never know their numbers. Yeah. Um, do you think for the state of the industry, for the, there's 211,000 Americans who are alive with a license to practice dentistry, 150,000 of them are 32 hours a week or more in general dentistry, 30,000 are 32 hours more a week in one of the nine specialties. What percent of those dentists right now know their numbers? Uh, if I have to wager a guess, I would say less than less than five percent, um, and it may be generous. Right. Uh, yeah, and and they just don't don't do it, and it's that's which is why which is why eighty two percent of the dentists have signed up for PPOs with an average fee reduction of forty two percent, and they don't even know that 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 means they'd have to have a fifty eight percent profit margin to break even and they're signing up for these plans with sixty five percent overhead and don't know that every time they do a filling on this patient they're losing money yeah and, and so it's, they it's, think they need to see more patients and work through lunch and everything they try to do like well i'm gonna work through lunch i'll take an emergency in the day yeah so lose more money right and every time we have a discussion i ask them so doctor what is what what do you think is your average hourly overhead, meaning every hour that you're open, how much expenses do you have? And they have no idea. They're like, it's it's a range, almost 50%, meaning it could be 50% higher or lower. And there you go, if it's 50% lower, there goes your profit, meaning it's most offices don't have 50% profit. They have anywhere from you know 25% to the best managed practice I've seen is about 50% overhead, uh, but that's rare. But was that rural? Uh, no, I've seen them in the city as well, but it's rare. It's not very common, meaning mostly it's about, you know, 35, 40% is, is quite common. 40% is also actually, it's not common. It's it's on well-managed offices. I'm sure we have about 300 offices that are, uh, that we have installed on. Uh, as we grow, I'm sure I'm going to find the other end of the spectrum as well, where the overhead is somewhere in the range of about, you know, 20, 25, 30% as well. And that's going to happen because there are so many offices, businesses that just show up to work and don't run their offices as a business. They show up to work and that's just not the right way to do things. So do you, um, you, you, you should take all your data and write, uh, 800, 1600 page article with some charts and graphs showing them average numbers because you're, you're sitting in a rare opportunity where you, you have a lot of data. These, these dentists, they, don't, they only know the data for their office and they don't even know their own numbers. You could show them cross-section of um, what, what you're seeing nationally. You know, do you like, you know, Southwest Airlines, I love their business model because they reduce every bill they pay into one common denominator of flying an airplane seat through the sky for a mile. And how they got the lowest cost structure is everyone else, um, d because of the hub and spoke system, were flying their planes about eight hours a day. And since Southwest was um, doing direct flights only back and forth, they were flying 12 hours a day. So once they paid all their bills for their airplanes, their kerosene, their, their labor, um, they, 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 they were flying four hours more a day. That, that's why I always like the the BAM number. What is the bare ass minimum we have to do today to pay all the bills? Some call it a BEP when I was at an MBA school, break even point. I mean, if a dental office 
truly wants 50% overhead, they should know what they have to do to pay the bills a day and then don't go to lunch until they broke that number. Then come back after lunch and do it again. There's 50% overhead. It's not just a bare ass minimum number, right? Knowing what your bare ass minimum number is per hour. So your front office understands how does she need to schedule each hour. So she's not putting three kids, four kids, five kids across the three or four or five chairs that you have. And then you end up having $300 in that whole hour in the office. That just doesn't work. So understanding it, not just from a, from a monthly you know, BAM, understanding what your hourly BAM as well is. And when you say, I'm gonna just work harder and I'm gonna work longer, that sometimes doesn't work either because in most offices, all your overhead or not all, but a bulk of your overhead is variable, right? Because it's your, it's your payroll, which is about 25% of your overhead is payroll. So if you just work extra, it's just gonna increase your overhead significantly. 25% of the overhead is what? Is payroll, staff expenses. Oh, you were saying people? Yes, people. Okay, that, uh, that um, Seattle, Washington accent, I d didn't catch that. You must, uh, see, see, that's what happens when you watch the Seahawks. It, make, it, make, <laughs> it makes you not talk right. You gotta watch the Arizona Cardinals. By the way, I'm being very generous podcasting someone from the Seattle area. You have to tell me you hate the Seahawks. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> so we, I, I have to tell you, I have to make a convention that I've been looking at Seahawks season tickets and trying to see if I can buy them off the black market and see transfer. So you're asking somebody who's very devoted. My God, that quarterback, you, you can't contain him. Just when you know he's going to sack, he just rolls out of the pocket and he's gone. Well, right. hopefully he's going to have a good, another good season. Oh my God. He's so good. <laughs> Um, I love watching. I I love the. I think the happiest day of my life every year is if uh, the Cardinals when they when they beat the Seahawks. Uh, and it's it's a rare occasion. They they can't seem to do it in Seattle. So I, no. I love that hourly BAM number. It's so important, but it it's still so hard for the dental office because, you know, let's go back to these PPOs. Say say your say your hourly BAM number was a dollar, and you sign up for um, a PPO and you're doing a filling in there and you think it's a dollar. But there's a but it, but then there's going to be a, an adjustment to production when you get the insurance check entered, and then find out that's only sixty cents. I just I just wish you're right. There needs to be an hourly BAM number for the receptionist, but they can't confuse this hour cost the dental office a dollar, and we scheduled a dollar dentistry, but that would only be if it was a cash patient. Eighty two percent of our patients are on some PPO, and there's going to be a big adjustment to production. I mean, sometimes when you enter those insurance checks. It just blows your mind. Yes, the adjustments and, you're taking off. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, absolutely. I Meaning it's it goes anywhere from as you know, thirty percent to almost sometimes fifty percent. Uh, and I've seen even worse. Uh, some of the big unionized plants can go even lower than that. But with that said, one of the biggest disservice you can do to a dental office is teach them on how to enter production, which is UCR when you're only getting back a fee schedule. And that's what that's what you mentioned, which is if you enter, let's say six, if you enter a $1 crown and you're only getting paid 60 cents for it, then your front office person has no idea how much you're gonna get back. So we teach and encourage every single dental office to use the fee schedule for the each insurance company. So when you schedule that crown, you know you're only getting 0.6 back so that your day makes sense, so that you're not scheduling production that you're never going to be able to collect on. So do not enter UCR, enter fee schedules. So know what's, what's your numbers are going to be at the end of the day, at the end of the month, before you get those insurance checks. Now, if you're using practice by numbers, we can show you the write-offs, we can show you all that good stuff. So you don't have to do it just to understand what your write-offs are. So that argument just doesn't apply anymore that use the fee schedules rather than using UCRs. Okay, well, a lot of, okay, so a lot of my homies listening to you right now don't even know what this is. So let this dentist uncensored. What is practicebynumbers.com? What does it cost? What does it do? Um, what key metrics does it follow? Explain the whole thing to someone. They're all they're all driving to work right now. They got an hour commute and they're like, what the hell's practice by numbers? What does it cost? What does it do? Okay, all right, perfect. So practice by numbers was started by myself, my wife, and we have another software co-founder to the company. The whole premise of our company is to be able to create accountability in a dental office. And why is accountability important? 
it's because you have million dollar, multi-million dollar offices many times being run by high school graduates, uh, to put it very politely. And you have to be able to understand top 10, 15 numbers, but then dive deep into the numbers that make sense to your staff. So what Practice by Numbers does is it connects with your practice management system. It connects with your QuickBooks account. It also brings in all your phones. So now you have... Uh, okay, it connects with QuickBooks, on, QuickBooks um, installed at the desk or QuickBooks online? Well, right now we do it with QuickBooks Online because nice. most of our customers use it with nice. QuickBooks Online. And then it's practice management. Which ones does it hook up with? Uh, we do it with the top three right now, which is EagleSoft's, uh, all versions, uh, 16 and above, uh, Dentrix, and Open Dental. And, 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 if you, and if some young kid who just graduated in dental school last week is going to open up a de novo practice, of those three softwares, what would be rank them in order of uh, being a, a, a CEO? Which would you do first, second, and third? There's different reasons for doing different software. I Meaning, I like all three of them, but if I have to pick one, uh, if cost is the concern, I would pick Open Metal. Ding, ding, uh, ding, 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 ding. That's all you hear. Yes. I mean, I, uh, I can't remember the last time anybody recommended Dentrox, Dentrix, or EagleSoft. I mean, I, I, I mean, I think the last time someone recommended those two was the same day I was actually ran over by the tooth fairy riding. <laughs> On the wrong side of the road, that damn tooth hurt. But uh, yeah, so Open Dental and, and Open Dental. What, what what is their cost structure? It's low cost. It's um. It's, oh, it's it's great set of people. First of all, meaning that's that's the most important thing. You want to have a great support team working with you. Um, that's that's one. But I think their startup costs are pretty minimal. I think they give you the software for free. I could yeah. be completely wrong. I think and, so. But that, but then there is monthly uh, support costs. I think it starts at. It used to start at hundred bucks a month, and for the first year, and then it goes up to one fifty, or vice versa. I, I I can't really remember. But it, it was also started by a dentist. Those are some of the greatest companies. Dan Fisher's Ultra Dent, Bob Ibsen's Den Man. Um, I mean, uh, you know, um, Open Dental was started by Jordan Sparks. Right. You know, a right. real live dentist in Oregon. And um, um, but but anyway, and then also another red flag you can find out is those guys never advertise anywhere. Yeah. They don't have to. They they yeah. they're growing so fast. The last thing they would do is advertise. But anyway, so continue. So QuickBooks Online, Practice Management Software, top three. What was the third thing you said? We connect with the existing phone lines, and phones, as you know, are still the heart. The they're still the pulse or the heartbeat of the practice. And in most offices, they have installed phones 20 years ago, which is great. The phones work fine, but they're really, the phones really don't tell you what's going on in the practice, how many calls they missed, how many new patients are calling in, how many new patients did, did you not respond back to, uh, what's happening to your response rate, uh, how much time are you spending on the phones. All of this stuff is very, very important. And it brings in all of that information into a single portal so you can track what's going on. Is your front office doing a good job with the phones? Or is your front office or your back office doing a good job with your supplies? Or uh, is your associate presenting treatment that's getting accepted? So how, so um, the phone lines uh, on um, Dental Town, there's um, some people have switched to, uh, so there's a digital phone line. That would be the old world that really didn't change from the telegraph to the telephone, um, uh, you call that analog, right? Right. And then there's the digital, which is the VoIP, the voice over internet uh, protocol. But it sounds like a lot of people um, thought their internet was very reliable, switched to VoIP, and then found out that you know your 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 internet can go out several times a day for a minute or two. What what, what is your thoughts about a VoIP phone system? <laughs> so with VoIP, and is, it, and, and is practice by numbers mean you have to be on a VoIP? No, so our uh, motivation to start the phone IQ product and practice my numbers was we, I personally don't like VoIP. Um, and the reason for that is I just don't want any hiccups on the phone. I just, I want the phones to be always up and always running and I want the sound quality to be perfect. I don't want the customers to have to repeat themselves or patients to have to repeat themselves or us to ask them, so what did you say? You just cut out over there. The phone on the and, other end. And the bottom line is, even though you're in Seattle and I'm in Phoenix, in a very wealthy nation, the United States of America, the the VoIP is not is not um, 
up and running all the time, is it? I mean, I think most people when they use their internet, um, they don't they're not using it like a phone, so they don't realize how many times the calls dropped or the internet's I mean, it's still it's still sketchy, isn't it? It still is, meaning it's like Skype. You know, it works when it works it's great, but it can go down and right. then then you and, have to scrap. People, and people don't realize when they're listening to this podcast that we do it over Skype, which was bought by Microsoft for eight point nine billion and they just bought LinkedIn. I don't know what they'll do with that, but um, how I mean, some of these shows that I do, um, the Skype will drop three or four times, and Ryan edits it all together and makes it look clean and makes it all look pretty. But I mean, Skype right. Skype is very unreliable. I, I couldn't imagine running a dental office where all the incoming calls were coming in over Skype. I mean, you just couldn't do that. So, so you you and I are both agree that VoIP is not there yet. Do you think it will be there like around the corner, a year or two, or do you think it's a long way off? No, I I think it's it's going to be there. I don't know if it's a year or two or if it's a little bit more as the fiber optic networks are being put into uh, cities all around the U.S. It's it's not a question of speed. It's a question of hiccups. It's 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 if it, the network goes up and down, if it has a hiccup, what's going to happen to the quality of the voice? It's the speed is always there. I mean, Comcast advertises 50 megabit per second, 100 megabit per second, but they don't tell you if there's going to be a little drop for half a I know, second and, somewhere. And, you're, and basically the things I've read is you're sitting there in your business on VoIP and it's nine o'clock in the morning and you don't realize that 15% of America is retired at home downloading Netflix videos and, and the trunk line between where your internet cable gets off the trunk line and goes yeah. through 20 grandma's houses all downloading a movie and that's the hiccup you're talking about. I mean, yeah. I've, I've read some studies that it, on a on a weekday in the evening, like seven o'clock at night, up to seventy percent of all the traffic is just movies on Netflix. Have you heard that? I yeah, I probably I believe it. Yeah, and I, and I also read that you know what the Western Hemisphere only has a billion people, so that the other six and a half billion people live on the other side of the world, and that all the fiber optic cables, I think there's twenty five cables, two inch diameter, going to the other side of the world, and that. When the Eastern Hemisphere downloads Netflix, it takes the all the entire capacity. So Netflix was forced to go over there and cache all their movies over there, so they're not downloaded from the Western Hemisphere to the Eastern Hemisphere because the video video just takes up so much more space than an email right. or a voice call, right? Right, 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 absolutely. So in with phone IQ and practice by numbers, we support. We started with supporting analog lines because we didn't want people to switch over to voice or VoIP. Okay. But so, mo so many of our customers had already switched over to VoIP that we added the VoIP uh, integration as well. So now if customers have any VoIP system, Nextiva, Jive, Vonish, we'll just work with them. But if they have an analog system, we work with that as well. Name, so, name the VoIP systems again. You said that fast. So the VoIP systems are, I mean, there's so many, but I'll name a name couple of the top top three or four. Uh, there's Vonish, that's V-O-N-A-G-E. Uh, there is Jive, that's J-I-V-E. And there's also Nextiva. These are the three that people, our customers have used, and, and they're fairly happy with it. Um, I'm sure they have hiccups, but uh, since they switched, they're sticking with it. Okay. All right, so so it is, so it is good enough for what percent of your clients use uh, VoIP? Uh, I would say maybe about ten percent. Uh, okay. So yeah, okay, I, so how much is it, and what are going to be the key metrics uh, that it'll uh, will be impacting? You said QuickBooks Online, your practice manager software, and your phone lines. And so, how much is this, and what do you do with that data? What key metrics are you going to be analyzing for me to run my business? So uh, the pricing is pretty straightforward. It's for most of our practices that are doing more than half a million and less than $3 million a year, the pricing is $300 a month for the practice IQ product, which is the whole practice management and the quick folks and all integrated into one system. If you add the phone IQ, which is the tracking of the phone lines, it adds 100 bucks. So for most practices, 500 to $3 million, it costs $400 a month if they add both the products together into it. Now, what does it track? Uh, the question, maybe it should be, what does it not track? There's, there's, a, there's a list of about 300 key performance indicators. Now, that's a, that's a big number, but if you can also 
create custom KPIs. So for example, let's say you want to start to measure internal camera use. You can do that because- It's a just, KPI. A lot of these kids don't know what a KPI is. A key performance indicator. And you can measure over 300 of them in here, right? Which are built into the system. So now we're saying you can create multiple uh, custom key performance indicators. So you can measure it based on code, you can measure it based on dollar value. And this is important, an example would be is, right? Um, how, what percentage of your hygiene patients are being given fluoride? It's a simple number. And we go and take a look at it, and sometimes it's less than the number of kids in the practice. So they're not just not even offering any to, all the, uh, to any of the adults, they're not even giving fluoride to all the kids. And that's a good number to know, right? That's, that's just one of the KPIs. Another KPI to look at is what percentage of your hygiene patients are being appointed for the next visit. Now, these, this is all simple stuff. We can, we can do this. This is, this is just easy stuff to do. Uh, a little bit more complicated things would be is looking at case acceptance. So, for example, what, how much treatment was presented last month? to all your patients. And out of that, how much treatment was accepted, meaning it was completed or scheduled. And you look at it by each provider, especially for practices that have multi-doctors in there, understanding it by the provider, by the doctor, makes a big difference, okay? And then looking at the different categories. So let's say you have, you just hire a new associate and that associate is a little bit green and their presentation skills are maybe not quite there, or maybe their treatment planning skills are not quite there as well, that, that you see a lot more three surface, four surface fillings being put in you know, second and third molars, and you have to ask yourself, so are we doing a patchwork over here, or is this gonna stay? Is this patient gonna come back in six months, nine months to get this replaced? So measuring all that is very easy. So you don't have to run around the, you know, run around the block to understand those numbers, they come automatically. Now, something is a little bit more indirect, which is not quite, you can't quite measure automatically, understanding, for example, what is the average family size? So the census, for example, and uh, 2010 census, states that the average family size is about 2.6. So if you see average family size in your dental office to be about 1.5, what does that tell you? That there's still scope over here. Now, unless you're in a retirement community, well, or you have a single or you know retired folks. If you're in a, if you have, if you have family practice, have you, you ever been? Family, to, have you ever been to Phoenix? Yes, I have. It, it's right halfway between Mexico and Utah, so you're either Catholic or Mormon. So the average family size is somewhere between six and 112. <laughs> I mean, and you know, and you know the difference between a Mormon coming to your practice and a Mexican. When the Mexicans come in and bring a three-year-old for a cleaning, the entire family comes. When the Mormon mom comes, she'll drop off the kid, go get some groceries. You know, I walked out in the waiting room. I'm not even making this up. Where I thought, oh my God, what what's going on? And it the whole room was for a six-year-old little girl in a dress with a bow in her hair getting a cleaning. So man, family size here. <laughs> is huge. Everybody has an SUV in Phoenix. But anyway, continue. Yeah, so, but for you, it'll be quite interesting when we run it on your practice after you transition over to uh, Open Dental. I'd be very curious to look at what is the family size in your, in your office. Is it is it two, three, four? Meaning that'll give you a very good idea what percentage of each family is coming to you. Okay, and if you, and if you do see it's less than two, you would ask yourself, are we really asking our customers or are we, are we really asking each of our uh, patients to refer their immediate family members? In many cases, they are not. So taking the numbers that are important and then driving direct key metrics that change behavior is what we do. So you can't quite come and wake up today and say, all right, the goal for this year is half a million dollars of income. That just doesn't work. And you tell that to your front office person and your front office person nods and says, okay, I, I got it, doc. We'll get right on it to make you half a million dollars this year. It just doesn't work like that, right? And 
even with that said, most uh, most doctors wake up and they go in and they create goals that individual staff members do not relate to. You have to take those high level goals and drive them down into lower level goals. Simple things like how many people canceled last month? And out of that people that canceled, what percentage of those people were reappointed? It's an important number. It doesn't directly address your profitability, but indirectly it does. And that drives the behavior on what's happening in your office. What percentage of calls were missed? Again, it's not a direct, I can't point to say, if you miss three calls, you're gonna lose that much profitability. It's an indirect relationship. But if you measure the indirect numbers, you can impact overall profitability of the office. And most people don't do it because there's no real clear way for them to be able to measure that. And there, there's a perfect football analogy in there too. Uh, um, the, the owner and the coach of the Arizona Cardinals, when they moved to, uh, from St. Louis to Phoenix, uh, were my patients because they were just right up the street. I, I mean, the, their, their headquarters is like two miles away. And they, they say something profound. He said, you know, it, when, it's not the play. It's when the play was executed, somebody missed a block, a tackle, a reception or a pass. It's always the fundamental. So you're saying you're not going to go in there in the morning huddle and give them some big flea flicker complicated play. That ain't how it works. You know, what is the, so if I asked you the increasing production collection, what are, would be the four bases? What would be the block, the tackle, the pass, the receptionist, where if everybody was doing those four things, we'd have incremental improvements. I think the most important thing if, if we can do is understanding where our patients are coming from and then don't let those patients fall through the through the bucket. So I, I use the leaky bucket analogy, right? Which is patients being coming, new patients being poured from the top and the existing patients leaving the practice. And most offices, it's a revolving door or, or a big leaky bucket that the practices don't grow. Actually, bigger practices that I've seen, I've gone in multiple times, they're shrinking. So understanding where your patients are coming from, then following up on those patients on treatment, recalls, reactivation. Those are the most, if you, if you circle all of this around the patients, that's going to be the, the big, huge block in a way, right? To say, okay, we you are said not where going are patients to patients coming from? Treatment, what were the other two? Uh, patient follow-ups. Uh, so that when the patient is presented to treatment, there's a follow-up with it. Uh, when patient misses their recall appointment, there's a follow-up. If patient is becoming inactive, we're calling these patients back. And in most cases, practices just wait for our patients to call them back. So let's go through that. What, what do you mean by where are patients coming from? You mean what marketing is working? Or what, what, what do you mean where are patients coming from? So what marketing is working for you is absolutely critical to understand and keeping your marketing companies accountable. So where are patients coming from is which referral sources, how many are coming from internal marketing and how many are coming from Google or Facebook are the flyer that you spent $50,000 in mailing out. Understanding it, measuring it, and then making changes to it to say, okay, all right, this is not working for us. Let's try something else. But, but, but you know, I, I, I feel sorry for marketing companies. I mean, I, I tell dental marketing companies to get out of dentistry and go, go to find a real business because they'll generate the leads. They'll generate the calls but that receptionist needs four people who've never called your office to get one butt in the chair. So on your phone IQ, does it differentiate? This is a phone number coming in from an existing patient versus this is a phone number coming in that's never called our office before, so they know it's a conversion oh, yeah. call? Oh, absolutely. So when the phone rings, it will, it does a little pop-up that shows up and says existing patient. And if that number is something we have never seen before, and that number that has never called your office before, we will tell you that this is potentially a new patient. And so, uh, so that, um, so then it, the, it, that syncs with your open dental contact. So does it pull up the patient's chart in open dental? Actually, what it does is it collects the information for not just that patient, it collects the information for the whole family members. So by the time the first string uh, comes through to your office, it brings it up in our phone IQ app. So everything is available to you right there at the first ring. So it'll tell you patient Joe calling three members are for your for, for your practice 
100 members in this family and 80 of them have not been scheduled for their next next recall appointment. So all of that information is right on your fingertips as soon as the phone rings. Now, if it's not an existing patient, it will say, hey, is this a new patient or a new contact? And why is that important? Because you wanna track every single call that comes in from an unknown source, from a lead that we say, and make sure that lead is handled. So, so then it'd give me a report at the end, so it'd give me a report how many new customers are calling my front desk and how many Valerie is converting to a butt in the chair? Exactly. I mean, that. I mean, most of these guys, yeah, it takes four calls to get one in the chair. Let, let's be optimistic, say it takes three calls to get one in the chair. And then the data is a one-third treatment plan acceptance for the United States of America. So to do one filling, I gotta get three butts in the chair. To get three butts in the chair, I gotta get three times three, I gotta get nine new people to call for three people to get in the chair to tell them each they have a filling to do one damn filling. Now, if someone could reverse that one filling, took three patients, took uh, nine calls, I mean, that's the funnel, that, that, that's the problem of all of dentistry. And then the funnel is why every practice that has, the average practice has 5,000 patients, but only 1,000 of them are, are active. So 4,000 never came back. Because again, that funnel for nine people who called and canceled their appointment or didn't get their hygiene next a recall scheduled before they left, only three of them will anyone ever follow up and call back and only convert one of them into the chair. So that's right. why nine to three to, I mean, so that's why you have 4,000 inactive charts. And by the way, what is your definition of an active chart or an inactive chart? Everybody's got their own definition. Some people just say, your active patient number should just be the number of people who are currently scheduled for anything in your office, whether it's a recall or a filling. What, what's your definition of an active patient? So that that's meaning that's a little aggressive definition, but what we use is any patient that was seen in the practice uh, that has not been deactivated and that was see, seen in the last 18 months. And was so, seen what? Six, seen in the last 18 months. So you're saying an active patient is any human who's been in your office in the last year and a half? Last year and a half. The chances of that patient to come back to your office, unless they have moved away or, or, or they had a bad experience, are fairly even if they need, have a need to come back to a dental office, which they all should. What happens is patients go from six months and then seven months pass by another eight, nine, 10. And then there's a little bit of a delay between when they last came and into your practice. And in the meantime, they're getting bombarded by other ads. They're getting postcards, flyers, Facebook. The next time they're two thirds and the dentist next door is offering a better new patient special, they're gonna switch over. So you have to build that loyalty. You have to build so that follow-up. The, if the active patients are the number of people seen in your office 18 months ago, let's say that number was 100. How many of that 100 do you think would be under my definition, was, which is actively has an appointment scheduled, whether it be for their three, four, six-month recall or dental treatment? So what I've seen in practices, that number is about 50%. Okay, so let's so, say... So, so the, they, they've already potentially lost half their practice in the last year and a half, it, unless that patient's going out of their way to call you back, had a relationship, you yeah, made them feel good. They, they may have, they may have lost those patients. So what we do is we measure patient retention. And this is how we measure patient retention. We look at every single patient that was active in your practice 12 months ago. And then we see if they are still considered active. Okay, and we want that retention to be at about 80% or higher. Okay. And practices, very few practices get there, meaning I have practices in about 75, 77%. 80% is hard to come by, but it's definitely doable because I've seen it. I've seen it happen in many offices. And that's, that's a good number to look at because ideally, yes, you want 80, 90% of your patients to be appointed. They have they should have a future appointment, but it's just not happening. I, I've just not seen that happen. If they have a very good recall and follow-up system so that nobody is missing their appointments, that when they do miss their appointments, they get back on the schedule. Well, you know, you know what I, I'd uh, recommend, um, you know, um, 
There's a lot of people right here now listening that are selling their practice, and it's a seller's market. Anybody in the urban who puts up a dental practice for sale is getting three or four offers just like that. Yeah. And if you get an offer and you think about it too long, um, that the, the house is gone. But, man, if I was uh, going to buy a practice, I would tell um, – you, you should call all the practice transitions people and say, install this so we have a really good snapshot of your practice. And what would really be cool, like if you're if you're in, a, in, in an area that's got 10 dentists and you're uh, having lunch with the guy across the street and you say, I'm probably going to sell my practice this year. If he installed practice transitions and then you um, knew your acquisition cost of a new patient, uh, which would be the first question they'd ask you on Shark Tank. They'd say, OK, what, how, how are you acquiring new patients? What's your acquisition cost? And if your patient mark, existing patient marketing was costing you. $150 to acquire a new patient, and then you put a bid on the old man um, selling across the street for $100 per uh, existing patients. You, you just have a the best marketing plan in the world. You'd buy a lot of new patients, and you would eliminate on the supply and demand curve, you'd eliminate a supplier in your backyard instead of having that old man who ran out of energy 10 years ago replaced by some kid who's going to be ramping up on steroids for the next 10 years. Uh, that, and, I, and I'd also imagine that with so many DSOs, I'm surprised a lot of DSOs don't outsource this to you. Have you, have you pitched DSOs? You're trying so, to run 50 offices in four different states? Yes, and we've been talking to, talking to several organizations. Uh, just recently, we, have, we are in discussion with a very large 400 group uh, management uh, DSO. It's it's more of a management rather than the ownership. Uh, I guess would be considered an MSO. So yes, those discussions are taking place. But I think some well, of the well, large what's the difference DSO and MSO. I I I don't profess knowledge in that. But from what I understand is that the DSO is they have some ownership stake into it, uh, versus the management organization is just trying to run their day to day operations, taking a taking a management fee out of it. So like a uh, management so structure. So you're in talks right now with an MSO that's running 400 dental offices? Yeah. Well, good luck on that. Can you, can you tell us the name? Uh, not quite yet. Um, e- email it to me. I, I, might, I might know the person. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I've looked at their groups a lot. But I, I would think that, um, you know, when you're really, really big, like Heartland or Pacific, they've been programming this stuff since day one. That's how they got that big. And these yes. kids don't realize that you – you, there's no more room to be an unsophisticated businessman because you've got competitors now that are extremely sophisticated. Right. I mean, and I noticed they also, all the big ones, they also all have call centers. I mean, when you call their uh, office, if it's not picked up on the third ring, it rolls over to headquarters and they, they're dialed into that practice. And that person that you're talking to doesn't even know that you're five states away in Effingham, Illinois, uh, scheduling an appointment for some um, buddy from Arizona. Yeah, I mean, they, they take all those details so serious. And when I got out of school 30 years ago, you could just wing it and be successful. You can't wing it anymore unless no, you're in no. rural. If you're yeah. two hours away from an airport, you're out there in Timbuktu, you can wing it and crush it. But if you're going to go into downtown L.A., San Fran, Seattle, or Scottsdale, you're, you you got to be sophisticated. But, you know, Dr. Fran, even in rural practices, when we go in and we see huge amounts of opportunity, and it's just – they are busy and they're just wasting opportunity away. They're just not following up with them. You just cannot run a business. And I think there's, there's the whole concept of just treat people right and you'll be successful. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but you can survive with it. But thriving by just showing up to work and peeping, treating people right will not happen. And success is not, not, it's, it's not an accident. So I talk to several dentists today, and the discussion that happens is, oh, well, uh, $300 is a lot. I'm like, okay, $300, yes, it adds quite a bit to your overhead. I get it. I Meaning we are practice owners ourselves, so we, I understand that. But our practices see growth anywhere from 5% to 25%. And when you see growth like that, how could you not do it? Right. Well, so, it's only it's only three hundred dollars is just one percent overhead for every thirty thousand dollars you're doing a month. 
So yeah. if you know these guys should be doing what, what? What is your average dental office? What do, what do you think the average dental office is doing a month? Uh, if they're if the average is seven fifty, divide that by twelve. They're doing sixty two a month. So the, you're talking three hundred dollars a month should be a half of a percent. The question is, will this data showing you how to um, do incremental a block a tackle a pass reception will it grow your business more than a half percent? It definitely will. Now, if you get the software and do, you don't log in and you don't use it and then you expect miracles to happen, it won't. But if you are invested in your practice and you use the data and you drive your staff accordingly, it absolutely will give you returns at least 10 times. And, and, and I want to explain something to my homies about market share information. You know, when a, when a big movie comes out or a song or whatever and the, the experts all give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, it's never really applied to me. I mean, if someone said this is a great movie or a bad movie, it never had any impact on me. Um, dentists are a different breed of cat. They're, they have eight years of college. They're doctors. Um, when it comes to market share information, like our Townie Choice Award in Dentaltown, when thousands of dentists vote on their favorite impression material, I mean, you, that, that's the hardest group of people to please. So the one thing I tell dentists out there if some company is staying in business and has a, you know, a thousand customers, you can't fool a thousand dentists. You could fool a thousand people in the B2C market, but not the B2B business to business dentist. I mean, every time that Townie Choice Award comes up, anytime I've talked to anybody who's an expert, I like Gordon Christian, he says, it's amazing how they're all so smart and they get it right. I mean, I've never had a Townie Choice Award come out and, in 15 years and people say, oh my God, they picked the worst product on the market. It's like, no, these are all the voters at eight to 12 years of college and were doctors. So when you see a business staying in business and dentistry, knowing that you can't get two dentists to agree that today is Wednesday, uh, it, it's a hard crowd to please, a very no, hard is. crowd to please. So yeah, it and, is. And I bet you you're getting amazing feedback from anally retentive dentists who are paralyzed, paralysis by analysis, I bet they've turned over every leaf and error and any thought they've had. And uh, so I, I, I bet you get better every single time you get off the phone with any dentist you've ever talked to. Oh, absolutely. Meaning we receive feedback all day long and our enhancement pipeline is huge. Just the other day we had a, a dentist call us and he, 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 he said, you know, Roy, it's the production by the furl source is not important to me. I don't care about production. How much am I producing from each referral source? The only thing I ever want to see is collection by the furl source, which is what we were not doing. I'm like, okay, fair enough. It's, it's a fair request. And a few days later, he had his dashboards and all the reporting updated. Now he was able to see collection by the furl source. So, Anything that request comes to us, we take it very seriously. Things that are low-hanging fruit, we do it right away. Things that take longer, we put it in the pipeline and, and we implement it. And the good thing is people with over, meaning with almost 300 installs, we have a pretty dedicated and pretty passionate set of early adopters that use our software day in and day out. And they give us feedback and you listen to that feedback and evolve, continue evolving a product. Well, um, do you integrate with the schedule um how so well i you know I, for me the, the 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 worst decision made is if that southwest airline seat which southwest reduced everything to find a seat to a mile if that operatory chair cost a buck and she schedules 50 cents for the dentistry in that chair that is how they're losing money and then when that's called to their attention then the receptionist say, well, I can only give you 30 minutes in that chair. And then the dentist said, well, there's no way in hell I could do that dental procedure in 30 minutes. Well, dude, you signed up for the plan. You signed up for the plan. Here's the fee. And it, oh, and so you either the only secret to accepting lower prices is lower your cost. Are you going to switch from composite to amalgam? Are you going to switch from, you know, a high-end lab up the street for 150 a unit to uh, um, some... Um, Milled uh, Bruxer for ninety nine dollars. You got to make some decisions. Either lower your cost or right. go twice as fast. Right. And that dentist decides I'm not doing that deal. Okay, then why are you still on this plan? I mean, I think the 
I and, and you and you with this, this I've seen this rodeo before and it was in the the NHS when I got to school 30 years ago all 20,000 dentists in the UK they were they're all participating in the NHS and they just kept lowering and lowering and lowering their fees well finally finally the smart ones they weren't even smart they're just like okay I'm going to go bankrupt yeah so they said I might as well just drop this shit and and go solo because I'm going to go under anyway and now you go to the UK and those 20,000 dentists 5,000 have walked from the NHS and almost everybody's still on it. The next 80%, it's some type of hybrid deal where a lot of them are doing bait and switches where they say, okay, I'll lose money on the NHS, but I'm converting 20 people a month to Invisalign, which is fee-for-service not covered, or dental implants or bleaching. So if you if you have a big base, I know I know a dentist in um that has this huge government Medicaid welfare office. But he's doing 50 Invisalign cases a month and has wow. uh, two um, orthodontist associates. So, so, you know, they just, you know, there's, uh, uh, it's like grocery stores. They, they give away milk and bread at cost because right. they're trying to get you to walk down the frozen aisle where the margins on that stuff are, are insane, you know. Right, right. No, and, it, and they you'll... lose money, by the way, on all produce. That's probably why Americans don't eat uh, vegetables. Because all the produce, the rot, the throwaway, it, it's a third of the stuff. Or if it comes in a box or a can, um, it'll, the shelf life's good. But for some reason, if it's frozen, Americans don't look at the price of a frozen pizza or whatever. They just open up those cold doors and throw the pizzas and ice cream and all that stuff in there. Okay, I'm just oh, talking I, about me. I'm just talking no, about no. me. I wasn't no, talking about no, I'm it's, the only. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding. But um, okay, but uh, so so yeah. I, do you think that's something in the future? You, I mean, it'd be so nice to be able to give them a report, and say, say on these, or, or or um, are you doing any analysis of the PPO plans? Like a lot of dentists don't even know how many PPO plans are on, or what percent of their patients are PPOs, or. No, we yes, we, that we already do. So we show them what percentage of their patients on on each plan, so they can do a little bit of an analysis to see how many have fee-for-service, how many have that HMO plan, how many have that PPO plan. It was difficult to do, but now it's a very it's, it's a very clean way of looking at it. We just give you a pie chart and you can understand how much it is. Not just doing analysis based on the patients where they're coming, which insurances, but also how much production came from each plan, how much collection came from each plan. So we all of that is already available. Now, with what you said about the chairs, even though we don't do it, we have the data. So we can take, let's say, your average daily per overhead, right? And we can take that daily overhead and split it among the three or four or six chairs that they're using and then use a little bit of heuristics to say, okay, so if you, if you have a daily overhead of about $6,000 for a large practice, that means, and if you have six chairs in here, uh, that means each chair has a daily overhead of about $1,000. And you divide that with the number of hours, so then you know that each hour of that chair is worth at least that much. So when they put something in there that only pays you 50 bucks, when your BAM there was 150, well, you know that you're losing money on that appointment. Now, what if what if um, a dental office gets this? How many how many states are you in? How many users you got? How and how long so has this been out? How, when did you roll out? How many customers? How many so states? We, how many countries? Is this uh, a U.S. play? Or can the Canadians get this? Canadians can get this. Anybody who uses the practice management system, we fully support Canadian codes as well. So uh, Canadians can get it. We have uh, customers using it in Canada, US. We have one customer in Mexico. And we have gotten inquiries from the UK, from Singapore. But of course, we're not supporting anything outside of the North America market. Well, I tell, I tell everybody starting a dental business, look, when you talk to the CEOs, all these um, big companies in dentistry, 40% of their global sales come from the United States. So there's so much money and market in the United States. You don't, you don't have to look outside the United States till you're doing millions and millions of dollars a month. I mean, there's just, it's, it's just so unbelievable that 5% of the earthlings live in America, 320 million out of seven and a half billion, and they buy 40% of all the dental stuff. Right. Uh, and they, they buy half of all the prescription pills. I mean, this is a monster market. I mean, it's just, it's a third of a billion. So, so yeah, you can uh, get huge. Um, right. Never, never leaving the United States. Uh, 
Well, well, eventually, well, Canada will support Canada. I mean, Canada's got almost 15,000 dentists in there, so it's Canada's a pretty good market, um, and Canadian codes are supported. And, and I see a lot of Canadian dentists on dental So, so, when, so when did you roll it out? Yeah, so we rolled it out um, last July, July-ish. Uh, we had a soft rollout. We were in beta for about two, three months, and the software was developed the year before that. So it took us almost a year to develop it, then we rolled it out. And from that point onwards, we have grown pretty rapidly. We so have, you're just one year old now. E, yes, the company nice, is nice. Is, so you're one year old, and and how many how many did you roll out to the first year? So and, by and that's personal. You don't have to say. No, it's it's not. I mean, it's a, we tell every person who comes in because they ask us because they ask they are interested in the viability of the company, the rate at which we are growing, and they want to make sure that the company is going to be around for a long time, because. It's, it's an investment in us as well, and we get it. And we've been growing pretty rapidly, and we have about 300 installs right now. So, nice. And, we, and, and, and what I like about you is so many of these companies, you know, you can search their name on Dentaltown, and no one ever responds to questions or their complaints. It's kind of like, why did you not put OJ on the witness trial? Because he hacked his wife and her boyfriend to death. And, and uh, I, 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 it, it's a total red flag. When people are talking about a dental company and there's an OSHA, I mean, just, just the fact, I don't care what they say. If just the fact that you're, you're, uh, I mean, you, you have raving fans on Dentaltown, but yeah. more important than having raving fans on Dentaltown, you're available, you're accessible. Um, now I'll never forget that in the Peter Lynch book, um, um, Beating the Street. He said, you know, they said, well, why you did, how did you make all the money? Why not all the other brokers? He says, because they sat, in their offices and read 10 Qs and 10 Ks about all these companies. I, every Monday, I left Manhattan and I'd drive around Ohio for a week, unannounced, I'd stop at the company, I'd walk in. Was it clean? Was I greeted? Was the CEO there? Was it available? Was he passionate? Did he give me a tour of his whole office? He said, I could smell, hell yeah, I'm investing in this company. And then I go to another company, it's dirty. Um, the receptionist, uh, he's not here, you know, well, can I get a tour? No, it's like, you know, he, he turned around and leave. He said, this place is a joke. You can smell success. Same with Swim with the Sharks without it getting eaten alive um, by um, um, that amazing man. What the hell was his name? Uh, gosh, darn it. Senior moment. Hell, he wrote an endorsement for my book. Same damn thing. You know, he said he'd walk the floor. Uh, you're, you make a religion out of availability, so I can smell your success. You're completely integrated in a relationship on dental town and i'm sure with your 300 customers and i, I bet you'll just uh soar yeah and and also uh being available harvey to mckay of... harvey mckay swim ah. with the sharks without eating alive nice. and that guy was so nice he taught in my mba class at asu and he wrote me a review for my book an amazing man but again it's it's walking the floor you know it's 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 knowing these numbers adibi uh who's adibi agarwal who's my wife and uh she is on Dentaltown all the time, and she's she's available. She's looking at it on a daily basis, and sometimes people ask us, "Aren't there more people in this company?" There are. We actually have several job openings. We are we are moving to a larger office. We are hiring people. Why am I always there and Nadidi is always there? Because the first five six hundred customers are extremely important to us because we want to make sure there we are hearing directly back from every single new customer that we bring on into a product. So I'm there discussing the product, training them, because this is all the input I need to make our product more successful. So having the founders involved is very, very important in any business. And if, if they go away, then that becomes a problem because the company just goes down from that point onwards. So what is what is most of the, uh, the feedback? What, what I mean, are they saying, okay, so they add... If they're doing sixty thousand a month, they had a half percent overhead. What 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 is their improvement of the fundamentals? I mean, what I what I'd like to just see the dentist do is just just become more profitable. I mean, like when you how many how many dental what what is the no, average number of PPOs that your dental three hundred dental offices are on? Average number? Oh, it ranges from anywhere from ten to thirty, forty. We don't measure that. I have in over it's almost three hundred offices. I have two offices or three maybe that are completely fee for service completely fee for service so you, you see one percent one percent and are those all rural 
No, they're not. Uh, they, then let me think about it. So three. No, they're not. They're not rural. Uh, they're they all are, city. They're all city. And two of them are just general practices. And then they're not doing a whole lot. They're doing very limited. They're doing one is doing less than half a million, and the other one is doing about eight nine hundred thousand. And they're pretty happy because their overhead is very much in control. Uh, the one office that's larger, it's a very high end cosmetic practice, and they're completely fee for service, meaning they do full mouths, and their their average case sizes are about fifty sixty thousand dollars, and they're completely fee for service. Holy moly! Crazy. And yeah, yeah, it is meaning, but it works for them. So, but outside of those offices, there might be one or two more, but it's not more than two percent of our offices are completely fee for service, and it's it's shocking. It's shocking to see how few offices are left that are fee for service. But now our sample size is very small, meaning three hundred is not a whole. It's not a very large number, right? Well, you so, know, it, it, it's funny because whenever you look at these polls on. CNN or Fox or these newspapers. I mean, for a country in America with a third of a billion people, they'll have surveyed 400 people. A big poll is 1,200 people. So when you think about it, um, yeah, there could be some biases that because of 300 people that made the decision to sign this up, was it because they were desperate and knew they, they needed help or is it because they were already doing great? Uh, good and they want to go from good to great so that that'd be what what is the bias you think do you think they're calling you because they're like man i'm taking on water i'm drowned and i need help or is it like tim collins greatest book he ever wrote good to great so, so what's the yeah. bias of your 300 users so we have we have a bias to all it's people who are interested in growing their business okay right. and that's those are the people that are calling us and they are they're from all walks of life meaning all all walks of practice, I would say, right? Which is, I have people who have, who just opened up three months ago and they want to make sure they manage it right. And, and kudos to them. We actually give the software away to our startup comp, uh, practices. We're like, use it till you get to a certain level. Use it for a month or two. Don't have to decide between paying the marketing bill and paying us. Don't pay us, but start using it. But then we have practices doing, I have practice doing $5 million, $6 million, and those practices are still hungry. People that don't call us are the ones that get lazy. They're cruising. They're just happy, showing up to work, taking home whatever they're taking. And they're, they're content. And they will call us when they start to realize that their growth is not like this. Oh, where's my hand? Not like this, not like this, but almost like this, right? Yeah, and then I, they will call us. I, I, I firmly believe that it, almost all humans were born with the same basic brains and that where they end up going is just where they were curiously directed. I mean, some dentists, I mean, I mean, I, I know so many dentists. I mean, I, I know dentists, their whole passion is their 40 head of cattle. I mean, they, they can't wait to get off work to go be, be play cowboy. And right. the only thing their dental office does is run their ranch at a loss. I mean, um, you know, um, some people are, you know, right now, um, they're not focused on their dental office because they, they got a sick family member, a mom, a, ki a kid, a child. Uh, but if you're hungry, which means you have a work ethic, and you're humble, which means you listen to workers, customers, and you have a strong curiosity towards something, you're going to be successful. So these 300 of the people that called you, they're, they're curious about business. Yeah. And, and, and you have to be curious about business because with corporate, they have a headquarter of paid professionals who are paid to be curious about how do we make McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, or this chain of dental offices better. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, uh, so w one thing, Dr. Ferran, we talk about to all our practices is a continuous improvement cycle. So if the last time you had meetings was several months ago, eh, that's the wrong answer. You need to be in a con constant improvement cycle because these big businesses are constantly in an improvement cycle, which is they measure, they improve and then they monitor, and they repeat the cycle over and over again. So They're not my, just my, my question is, um, th these people get all this data, but um, what do they need someone to talk to? Do you work with in-office consultants? Do you, do you have someone in the flesh that can go to the, the deal? Do you work with other people? Do you do this by phone service, Skype, or FaceTime on iPhone? What, what, what if this dentist signs up, he's got all these numbers, 
and every and he's just got more questions than answers. <laughs> yeah, and that happens. That happens uh, more often uh, than than I thought it would. But uh, there's multiple resources. One is we have a YouTube channel, and we post videos on it. Um, and the second is. We have consultants that we're working with now. You know Sandy Purdue, uh, who's uh, quite Sandy well- who? Uh, yes, Sandy exactly. who? Sandy Purdue. <laughs> so Sandy is very well respected in Dental Town, and rightfully so. And she started using practice by numbers in all her client for all her clients because she sees the value. So we have consultants that we work with as well, and Sandy's Sandy's one of them, but one of the one of the obviously better known ones on downtown but others as well but then we also have training videos that laura hatch from front office rocks oh creates. i love her San Diego. yes 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 and so she she is also another resource that can that people from practice my numbers do use as well so that okay your call numbers are bad your conversion numbers are bad i can't help you with that because i i don't train staff members i don't have that that's not my core competency to train your staff members but that's what Laura. Who, who else besides Sandy Purdue, Laura Hatch? So we have some of the smaller consultants. Another person that was using uh, practice by numbers. Uh, her name is I think she. Uh, I forget where she's from, but her name is Lorraine Guth. Lorraine Guth out of St. Louis. Yes, so she's using it as well, and then we're in discussions with several others, uh, in having them. In for, meaning take this and apply it to all of their consultants. So you know what we should do next? Because we just, we, we went over an hour. You know what we should do next? Yes. We should get, we should do, did, did you ever watch the Brady Bunch when you were little? Uh, um, just a little bit. I, they, did, they didn't have it in India. So. Oh, you grew up in India? Yes. Well, well tell us your journey. Where, where were you born and raised? I was, I was born in Chandigarh, which is a small town north of Delhi. And then I went to the east of India to get my undergraduate from Indian Institute of Technology. And then at uh, 21, I moved here to Seattle. And I've been in Seattle since then. And where did you um, find your lovely wife? In India or Seattle? Oh, in Boston. Uh, Phillips used to have a headquarters in Andover, Massachusetts, which is just a little bit away. And uh, as you know, all Indian parents are. They were like, oh, you're yeah, going there. I have a friend who has a daughter who's going to dental school. Go uh, meet her, I say know. hello. I, so. I know. It's Indians <laughs> and Persians. Everybody will go to a Persian wedding because that's where you're going to find your next wife. Per- have you ever been to a Persian wedding? Yes, I have. I yes. mean, it costs more than a brand new Cadillac. And, oh, it's, and, yeah. and, and, and people are flying in from Iran to 20 different states because they know yeah. The only way they're going to get a hot date with that hot girl over there is because somebody's brother's uncle's nephew is going to set them up. But but anyway, the Brady Bunch, it had all six or nine squares. It was the three kids, the three girls for the mom, the three boys from the dad, and the maid, Alice, in the middle. But we should do a Brady Bunch. We should do the next podcast with Sandy Pardue, Laura Hatch, Lorraine Guth, and you. At the same time, we'll have four screens, and they can talk in the field specifics for an hour about what type of, uh, and, and we'll ask them the question, um, you know, if this is a football game, what is the block, the tackle, the pass, the, the reception? I don't want some complicated flea figure, but what are these guys doing? How, how is it changing? You know, you got to, you said it best. You can't give your staff some goal without an action plan. You got to find what are the little behaviors and actions that if we all went out there, and everybody did their job. Everybody blocked and tackled and threw the pass and caught it. Everybody did their job. We could grow earnings, not grow production, which right. half of this PPO production. I mean, I can't tell you how many dental office consultants I've talked to where they'll go in office, like you say, that they're taking anywhere from 10 to 40 PPOs and go in there and say, dude, this is a 50% reduction in fee. Now, if you had a 50% overhead, you'd be doing it for free. Dude, your overhead 68%. So, yeah. you know, if you want to do charity dentistry, that's great. I mean, but do you realize you're doing charity dentistry? Yeah. And um, and do you realize you're doing charity dentistry on people who drove in here in a car smoking cigarettes, drinking beer, and had a $5 Starbucks in their hand and are going to eat a uh, pizza hut tonight? So um, I, I think that would be great. I think they'd all do it. I I, I, I had Laura Hatch come on twice. Or, or no, Lauren Guth come on twice. She's so damn good. Do, do you you want to you do that? 
I, I'd love to do that. So um, I can work with Ryan and figure out a time that would work for all four of us. No, or, I mean, all no five. You, 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 you find a time you all four agree, and we'll just adjust back from there. I'll, okay. I'll cancel back because that, those are four damn busy people. And I'd just be so humble. But I think that would be give them an awesome deal because, like I say, I love, them. I love dentists. I mean, God dang it, if you ever spend the night in a dentist's home, they always have a hundred nonfiction books. They got eight to 12 years of college. These are some of the smartest people I've ever met. And, right. if, they're, and if you're in their house, and they're not a dentist, they're not a lawyer, they're not a physician, there's no nonfiction books. It's like Fifty Shades of Grey and People Magazine, and they can't name you the president mm -hmm. of, a, of another country. And if they talk about world history, they can't even get their, their wars right. I mean, you know, the, uh, but these are smart people. Yeah. They're just in love with doing surgery with their hands. And I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. But we have to, our job is to try to develop a curiosity into their um, business or corporate's going to eat their lunch. And corporate yeah. is not going to be able to eat their lunch because as everybody keeps saying, corporate's growing, 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 growing. Corporate has one small problem. They can't keep any of their associate dentist. No. So no, if I everybody's going to quit in two years and you own a dental office, that's not a good business model. I mean, basically their business model to me looks like right now is they're going to provide jobs for everyone the first two years out of school. And yeah. that's a market, but it's a limited market because deep down inside every homo sapien wants their own house, their own car. They don't want to work for you. They don't want to be under your thumb. They hate transparency. They hate checks and balances. Basically a, a ape says, leave me alone and get out of my way. I want to do it my way. Right. And what's also happening is, is, the, is the growth of, I wouldn't call it corporate, but crew practices. And, and that's, that's something that's going to actually block the growth of corporate dentistry to some extent till those group practices capitulate and just sell it to corporate, right? Because it becomes a bigger target on their backs. Uh, but I'd love to do that. And also the other thing is I'm presenting, uh, giving a demo to, I think, Robert tomorrow um, or Friday, I believe. In, online in, in your, or you come to Phoenix? No, I'm doing it online. Uh, and what we will do is as soon as you convert to do open dental, we'll Which get is it July installed. 4th. We're doing it over the 4th of July weekend. Perfect. So we'll get it installed. And once it's installed, then I'll come over. So we'll go through your practice. We'll take it up, you know, put it upside down, you know, dissect it every which way. Hopefully the conversion goes well, because if the conversion doesn't go well, then we might have to wait for a few months for you to collect more data. But if the conversion goes well and most of the data transfers over, then we'll be able to do a lot of analysis right away. So I'll come over either in July and we'll figure out a time when you have a couple of hours to sit with me as well and really look into the practice details uh, on your practice. Okay. All right, buddy. Well, um, thanks for being a townie. Um, thanks for always posting. Uh, thanks for always sharing what you do. Tell your lovely wife, Dr. Aditi Agarwal. And, uh, and is, she, um, is she the younger sister of my buddy T-Bone, Tarun Agarwal, one of the most infamous townies of all? No, she isn't. She uh, is, no, but... tell, tell, tell her that I said on Dentistry and Censor that T-Bone is her dad. <laughs> T -bone would love I'm saying, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm telling everybody that your wife is T Bone's daughter. That's how old you are, T Bone. But uh, um, yeah, T Bone's one, one of the most amazing dentists that ever lived. Um, oh. and we both went to the same dental school, UMKC. Oh, you really? Okay. Yeah, and he's the one who created uh, him and Samir Puri, or the ones that created the townie meeting because I had four kids, I didn't have time to do it, and they they did that for ten years, and then and then they had kids. Yeah. So then they uh, they uh, gave it to me for the same reasons I gave it to them because you know it's just not, now I got grown kids and grandkids. But hey, dude, uh, thanks for all you do. Um, I look forward to um, the Brady Bunch. God, that would be so fun. Sandy Purdue, Laura Hatch, Lauren Guth. My God, that'll get a hundred thousand views just on Facebook. I mean, it'll just be huge. Yeah, no, it will be. So yeah. I can, I, I'll pull that together. And so I'll... when he pulls that together, well, no matter what time of the day or night is, whatever I got going, I will cancel and and meet your schedule because it's just a huge honor to have you four uh, townies on at the same time talking nitty gritty details of what they're seeing in the field about how this product helps people make better decisions. Right. Okay. Awesome. I'll get that set up. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it, it's a, it was a pleasure talking with you. Ah, oh, thanks, buddy. Have a rockin' hot day, and down with the Seahawks. <laughs>
down no. with the Seahawks. Uh, 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 may uh, none uh. of them show. May may none of them show up for practice on the first day. <laughs> <laughs>